Hello and welcome back to the study on the life of Christ. We're trying to do a chronological study, but it's obviously it's quite difficult. But we'll see what we can do. We're looking at the first year and a half of Christ's ministry, the year of preparation. We see this in many different forms. And we're looking at primarily at the moment the ministry of John the Baptist, of John the Baptizer, and these texts are where they're found. So the Old Testament prophets had described a person who would appear on the scene as a forerunner to introduce or to prepare the way for the Messiah in Isaiah 43 and Malachi 3.1. With his appearance and preaching, John had fulfilled this prophecy. John's message was twofold. The king is coming. Prepare yourselves to enter his kingdom. John mainly worked around this area here. This is a, a chronological life of Christ where someone has put together uh, the study and you can see in red Matthew and darker uh, colour is Mark and the green colour at the moment is Luke. <clears throat> so when we read this small section together, we look at Matthew 3, 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and said she's coming to his baptism. He said to them, brood of vipers who put in the minds a flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit fit for repentance. The context, the background of that starts off. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria, Trachonitis and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. And the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. He came into all the region around the Jordan and the wilderness of Judea, baptizing and preaching the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who is spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled, every mountain hill will be brought low, the crooked will become straight, the rough ways smooth, all flesh will see God's salvation. Now John himself wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, his food was locusts and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all of Judea, and all the region around Jordan went out to him, they were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw how many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bring forth fruit worth, worthy of repentance. Don't think to yourselves, we have Abraham for your father. For I tell you, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. This is the same section seen in a different way. And again, Luke 3, all the different passages. So, Matthew 3, 7 to 10, when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, uh, he says, who, who said to you that you could flee? I baptize you water, the one who repent, the one who has come out to me is stronger than I. I am not fit to carry sandals. The Jews were divided into three great sects, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. In addition to these, some smaller sects are mentioned in the New Testament and also by Josephus. The Herodians, probably political friends of Herod. The Galileans, a branch of the Pharisees. The Therapeutae, a branch of the Essenes, but converts from the Greeks. Josephus tells us that two leading sects of the Jews started about the same time in the days of Jonathan, the high priest of about 159 to 144 BC. But the sentiments which at that time divided the people really began in the minds and hearts of the Jews immediately after the return from the Babylonian captivity. Those returning Jews differed as to attitude and policy which Israel should have towards their pagan nature, neighbors. Some contended for a strict separation between the Jews and all pagan peoples. These eventually formed the Pharisee party. The name Pharisee means the separate. 
The Pharisees had a great deal of influence in the communities they lived. However, they didn't live as they preached. The Pharisees were very wealthy, zealous, powerful sect among the Jews. They were proud, conceited, worldly, and, and vigilant enemies of our Lord. Yet, they were the leaders among the ancient Jews and doubtless had many fine and commendable qualities which tend to be obscured by the fact that they opposed the work of Christ. Ledler lists seven distinct classes of Pharisees as follows. The shoulder Pharisee, who wore all his good deeds on his shoulder and did his arms to be seen of men. The wait a little Pharisee, who always suggested something else to do first. Of this type was a man who, when asked to follow Jesus, said, Suffer me first to go and bury my father. The bruised Pharisee, who was too pious to look upon a woman, and who shut his eyes when one approached, which caused him to stumble into a wall and be bruised or cut. The pestle and mortal, mortar Pharisee, who walked with his head down in mock humility, also called the humpbacked Pharisee. The ever-reckoning Pharisee, who kept a ledger of good deeds and bad deeds in an effort to balance accounts with himself. The God-loving Pharisee, the noblest of the group. The timid Pharisee, who was schizophrenic in his day. He was probably to this latter class that Jesus observed, addressed his warning that no man can serve two masters. Originally, these Pharisees were genuine patriots and reformers. But later, the majority of them became mere legalists. As theologians, the Pharisees represented the Orthodox party and were followed by the vast majority of the people. They believed in the resurrection of the dead, a future state with re rewards and punishments, angels and spirits, a special providence of God carried out by angels and spirits. As a sect, they said to have numbered 6,000 at about the time of Herod's death, they were the patriotic party and the zealots were their extreme section. They covered extremely selfish spirit with a pious formalism. By parading their virtues, they obtained an almost unbounded influence over the people. By exposing their hypocrisy, Jesus sought to destroy their power over the multitude, which resulted in the bitter enmity with which they pursued him to his death. Some of the other of the captives who returned from Babylon and desired a freer interaction with the pagans and wanted to break away from every restraint which barred them, these became Sadducees. They considered to no other restraint than the scriptures themselves imposed. They interpreted these as loosely as possible. Some take a name to mean the party of the righteousness, but more think it comes from the founder Zadok and is a corruption of the word Zedekite. Zedek flourished about 260 BC. His teacher, Atigidus Suchis, taught him to serve God disinterestedly, that is, without hope of reward or punishment. The Sadducees were essentially aristocratic, a person of noble heritage and character. They derived their power from their class, while the Pharisees derived their power from their learning. From the fundamental doctrine of no punishment or reward sprang the other tenets, of the Sadducees. They denied all four points held by the Pharisees, asserting there was no resurrection, no rewards and punishment, no angels, no spirits. They believed there was a God, but denied they had any special supervision of human affairs. The Sadducees were the materialists of that day, considering all God's promises as referring to this world. They looked upon poverty and distress as evidence of God's curse. Therefore, to bring relief to the poor was to sin against God, interfering with God's mode of government. The Sadducees were fewer than the Pharisees. They were rivals in power, for they were the aristocratic party and held the high priesthood with all its glories. We often remember the Sadducees as being sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees' high political position, their great wealth and Roman favour which they courted by consenting to foreign rule and pagan customs, made them a body to be respected and feared. 
So we find John preaching in the wilderness of region around Jordan. His message was one calling for Israel to repent of their sins in preparation for the Messiah's coming and the coming of the kingdom of heaven. Remember, Matthew 3, 2 said, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. John knew that the time was very close. Although John was in an unpopulated area, people from Jerusalem, Judea and areas around Jordan came to him to hear his message. They responded to the message by confessing their sins and being baptised. What is the baptism of John? It's for the remission of sins. If John was baptising for the remission of sins, what was the difference, perhaps, between his baptism and that of the Lord Jesus? Later on, Mark 1, 4 says exactly like Luke, that John's baptism was for the remission of sins, for forgiveness of sins. Luke 3, 3. Ice, a feast in Hamartian. Acts 2, 38. Ice, a feast in Hamartian. Matthew 26, 26. Ice, a feast in Hamartian. Ice, in order to, towards, for the purpose of. The, uh, the same phrase in the Greek is used in all these three different passages. Uh, and so each one is looking forward to what Jesus will do in his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, everyone be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Luke and Matthew 26 uh, is before the first gospel message is proclaimed. Acts 238, Peter uses it in proclamation of the first gospel message. Baptism, the purpose, is for the remission of sins. And of course, Acts 238 adds on, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, what was the difference between baptism John and baptism Jesus? Baptism Jesus commands us for us to become Christians today. I believe the baptism in water and the purpose of the baptism was exactly the same. The difference was that John was preaching and baptizing, looking forward to the blood of the cross being shed. Whereas we are baptized, looking back to the death, burial, and resurrection, the blood being shed in the cross. We are baptized into relationship with or by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we receive the extra bonus of the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Coming to his baptism, he said, Therefore to the multitudes that were to be baptized by him, he said, principally to the leaders, but his denunciation indirectly included the multitudes who followed their leadership. John's message was a demand for change. It appears that the common man responded to John's teaching. But when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to see this wilderness prophet, they were greeted with brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Were they vipers? No, they were people. But their actions were every bit as poisonous as that of a viper. In John's message, there's both a threat and a promise. This whole passage is full of vivid pictures. John calls the Pharisees and the Sadducees a brood of vipers and asks them who has suggested to them to flee from the coming wrath. There may be at least one or two pictures here. John knew the desert. The desert had places thin, short, dried grass and stunted thorn bushes, brittle for want of moisture. Sometimes a desert fire would break out. When that happened, the fire swept like a river of flame across the grass and the bushes, for they were dry as tinder. In front of the fire, there would come scurrying and hurrying the snakes and the scorpions and the living creatures who found a shelter in the grass and in the bushes. They were driven from the lairs by this river of flame, and they ran for their lives before it. Brood of vipers, offspring of vipers. A metaphor for their likeness to vipers, as like them as if they had been born of them. The viper was a species of serpent from two to five feet in length and about one inch thick. Its head is flat, its body a yellowish colour, speckled with long brown spots. It's extremely poisonous. Remember Paul in Acts 28, 6. John probably borrows the figure from Isaiah 59, verse 5. It means the Jewish rulers were full of guile and malice and cunning and venom. The serpent is an emblem of the devil. 
Jesus not only repeated John's words, Jesus interpreted the words. He told them plainly, they were the children of the devil. There's also another picture here. There are many little creatures in a standing field of corn, field mice, the rats, the rabbits and birds. But when the reaper comes, they're driven from their nests and their shelters, and as the field is laid bare, they have to flee for their lives. It is in terms of these pictures that John is thinking, if the Pharisees and Sadducees are really coming for baptism, they're like the animals scurrying for life before it is at fire or in front of the sickle of the harvester. These men thought that every uncircumcised Jew would be saved. John is telling them, this is not so. Those who are not willing to repent and be baptized would face the wrath of God. Those who rejected John's baptism were in effect rejecting God. As Luke in 730 writes, but the Pharisees and lawyers, they rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. In a similar way, those who reject water baptism that Jesus instituted, which is also for the forgiveness of sins, are rejecting the will of God. The Jewish rulers well deserved the name Budavitas, for they poisoned the religious principles of the nation, accomplished and accomplished the crucifixion of the Son of God. Who warned you to flee? John's baptism, like that of Moses at the Red Sea. It was a way of escape from destruction. Christian baptism is also such a way, and whosoever may enter through baptism in Christ's blood into the safety of the kingdom of Christ. But baptism cannot be used as an easy bit of ritual to charm away evil. It must be accompanied by all the spiritual changes which the ordinance implies. Prophecy foretold that the Messiah's times would be accompanied, accompanied with wrath. But the Jews were all of the opinion that this wrath would be meted upon the Gentiles, and were not prepared to hear John applying the prophecy to themselves. To all his hearers, John proclaimed the coming kingdom. To the unrepentant, he proclaimed the coming wrath. John's teaching would have been a big blow to these Pharisees and Sadducees because he was saying they couldn't rely on the birthright. Instead, they would be judged by the hearts and their lives. The same is true for us today. John gave him a vigorous shaking. It was the only way he could hope to waken their slumbering consciences. Second Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Each one of us may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Hebrews 4, 12, 13 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's no creature hidden from God's sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give, ultimately, an account. Thus John prepared the way for the first coming of the Messiah. We who would prepare the people for his second coming would do well to follow John's example. The scriptures have a voice of warning and denunciation as well as a word of invitation and love. Whoever admits the warning of judgment speaks but half the message which God would have us deliver. God's wrath is in his resentment and action against sin. Such talk would shock most Christians today, but they miss the point of the gospel. The gospel is not a message to make people feel good about themselves, although it's part of its ultimate effect. The message of God's Son is to get people to change, and many people will not change. They feel they're fine just as they are. Fruits worthy of repentance are required, just as fruit tree is expected to bear fruit. God's people should produce a crop of good deeds. God has no use for people who call themselves Christians but do nothing to show it. Fruits of conduct. Be careful of false prophets. They come to you wearing clothes to make themselves look like sheep. But they are actually fierce wolves. You'll be able to tell them by the fruit. Can people pick grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A bad tree nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That is the proper fruits of reformation, the proper evidence 
that you have truly to see him. It is by our fruits that people will know us. We can't judge a person's heart. However, we can judge their fruit, their speech, their attitudes and their actions. Worthy of repentance, fit for repentance, appropriate to repentance, the proper expression of repentance. There must be evidence of this new life. We can't just go through the act of baptism. There must be a fruit in your life. John warns him, we have nothing to plead that Abraham is our father. To the Orthodox Jew, that was an incredible statement. To the Jew, Abraham was unique. So unique was Abraham in his goodness and his favour with God, his merits sufficed not only for himself, but for all his descendants also. Abraham had built up a treasury of merit, they said, which not all the claims and needs of his descendants could exhaust. Abraham was good enough for all of them. So the Jews believed that a Jew, simply because he was a Jew, and not for any merits of his own, was safe in the life to come. They said, all Israelites have a portion in the world to come. They talked about the delivering merits of the fathers. They said, Abraham sat at the gates of Gehenna to turn back any Israelite who might have by chance have been consigned to its terrors. They said it was the merits of Abraham which enabled the ships to sail safely on the seas. It was because of the merits of Abraham that the rain descended upon the earth. It's the merits of Abraham which enabled Moses to enter into heaven and to receive the law. It was because of the merits of Abraham that David was heard. Even for the wicked, these merits sufficed. They said, Abraham, if your children were mere dead bodies without blood vessels or bones, your merits would avail for them. John is saying, genetic, biological relationships, racial or national heritages, family ties have nothing to do fundamentally to do with our relationship with God. God's interested in character, not colour of skin or cultural circumstances. All these things may have some bearing on the formation of our character, but they count for nothing in themselves concerning our future life. It is this spirit which John is rebuking. Perhaps the Jews carried it to an unparalleled distance, but there is always need of a warning that we cannot live on the spiritual capital of the past. A degenerate age cannot hope to claim salvation for the sake of a heroic past. An evil son cannot hope to plead the merits of a saintly father. A degenerate age cannot hope to claim salvation for the sake of a heroic past. An evil son cannot hope to plead the merits of a saintly father in the more modern text. God wants children of Abraham by faith and good works. God is partial towards anyone, anywhere, who believes and obeys his word. We stand before God trusting in the blood of Jesus. Now once again, John returns to his harvest picture. At the end of the season, the keeper of the vineyards and the fig trees would look at his vines and his trees, and those which are fruitless and useless will be rooted out. They only wasted space on the ground. Uselessness always invites disaster. The man who is useless to God and to his fellow men is in a grave peril, is under condemnation. Just as a fruit tree is expected to bear fruit, God's people should produce a crop of good deeds. God is no use for people who call themselves Christians but do nothing about it. Like many people in John's day who are God's people in name only, we are of no value if we are Christians in name only. If others can't see our faith in the way we treat them, we may not be God's people at all. God's message hasn't changed since the Old Testament. People will be judged for their unproductive lives. God calls us to be active in our obedience. John compared people who, had cl who claimed they, they believed in God but don't live for God to us unproductive trees that will be cut down. Despite being saved by his grace through the blood of Jesus and our response to by our, our obedient faith to be productive for God, we must obey his teaching, resist temptation, actively serve and help others and be prepared to share our faith. Why should we be asking ourselves how productive? We should be asking ourselves how productive are we for God? 
as the great English poet W. H. Auden once said. Why are we here? We are here to help others. Why are the others here? I have absolutely no idea. In all John's preaching before baptism was the basic demand, demand to repent. This is also the basic command of Jesus himself, for Jesus came saying, repent and believe in the good news. It has been noticed that both Jesus and John used the word repent without any explanation of its meaning. They used repent as a word which would assure that hearers would know and understand. We will do well to seek to understand what this repentance is and what this basic demand of the king and his herald means. To the Jew, repentance was central to all religious faith and to all relationship with God. Repentance is a soul but inexorable condition of God's forgiveness and restoration of his favour. The divine forgiveness and favour are never refused to genuine repentance. The rabbis taught Repentance was one of the things created even before the law. The six things are repentance, paradise, hell, glorious throne of God, celestial temple, and the name of the Messiah. The rabbi said a man can shoot an arrow for a few furlongs, but repentance reaches even to the throne of God. There's a famous rabbinic passage which sets out repentance in first of all places. <coughs> Who is like God, a teacher of sinners, that they may repent? They asked Wisdom, what shall be the punishment for the sinner? Wisdom answered, misfortune pursues sinners. They asked Prophecy. It replied, the soul that sins shall die. They asked the Law. It replied, let him bring a sacrifice. They asked God. And he replied, let him repent and obtain his atonement. My children, what do I ask of you? Seek me and live. So then the Jew, the one gateway back to God, is the gateway of repentance. The Jewish word commonly used for repentance is self-interesting. It's the word teshuba, which is a noun for the verb shub, and means to, to turn. The Greek for, word for repentance, metanoia, means change of mind change of direction. It's a military term used in drilling soldiers, or means about face, to the rear, march. True repentance is a turning away from evil and turning back towards God. The transparent primary meaning of repentance in Judaism is always a change in man's attitude towards God and in the conduct of life, a religious and moral reformation of the people or the individual. The rabbi is the essence of repentance, lay in such a thorough change of mind that it issues in a change of life and a change of conduct. Maimonides, the great medieval Jewish scholar, defines repentance thus. What is repentance? Repentance is that the sinner forsakes his sin and puts it away out of his thoughts and fully resolves in his mind that he will not do it again. As it is written, let the wicked forsake his way, and the bad man his plans. Jeff Moore, more interesting, very truly points out that, with a single exception of the two words in brackets, the Westminster Confession definition of repentance would be entirely acceptable to a Jew. <clears throat> repentance unto life is a saving grace, whereby a sinner, out of true sense of sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of the endeavour after new obedience. Again and again the scriptures speak of this turning away from sin, this turning back towards God. Ezekiel had it, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn back, turn back from your evil ways, why would you die, O house of Israel? Jeremiah said, Bring me back that which that I may be restored, for you are the Lord my God. Hosea said, Return, O Israel, to the Lord thy God. Take with you words and return to the Lord. 
From all this, it's quite clear that in Judaism, repentance has in it an ethical demand. It's a turn from evil to God, with a corresponding change in actu act actions and attitudes. John was fully within the tradition of his people when he demanded that his hearers should bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. There's a beautiful synagogue prayer which states, Cause us to return, O Father, unto your law. Draw us near, O King, unto your service. Bring us back in perfect repentance unto your presence. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who delights in repentance. But that repentance had to be shown in a real change of life. A rabbi commenting on Jonah, Jonah 3.10 wrote, My brethren, it is not said of the Ninevites that God saw their sackcloth and their fasting, but that God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. The rabbi said, Do not be like fools who, when they sin, bring a sacrifice, but don't repent. If a man says, I will sin and repent, he's not allowed to repent. Five unforgivable sinners are listed, and the list includes those who sin in order to repent, and those who repent much and always sin afresh. They said if a man has an unclean thing in his hands, he may wash them in all the seas of the world, it will never be clean. But if he throws the unclean thing away, a little water will suffice. <clears throat> the Jewish teacher spoke of what they called the nine norms of repentance, the nine necessities of real repentance. They found them in a serious commands in Isaiah 1.16. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. The son of Sirach writes to Ecclesiasticus, Say not I sinned and what happened to me, for the Lord is long-suffering. Do not become rashly confident about expiation and go on adding sins to sin. And do not say, His compassion is great. He will forgive the multitude of my sins, for mercy and wrath are with him, and upon sinners his anger will rest. Do not de de delay not to return to the Lord. Do not put it off from day to day. He writes again, a man who bathes to purify himself from contact with a dead body and touches it again, what profit was there in his bath? So a man who fasts for his sins and does again and does the same things, who will listen to his prayer? What profit was there in his afflicting himself? The Jews have still more things to say about repentance and will help us to understand better if we go to look at a couple of them. The Jew held that true repentance issues not merely in a sentimental sorrow, but in a real change in life. And so does the Christian. The Jew had a holy, ho holy horror of seeking to trade on the mercy of God. So is the Christian. The Jew held that true repentance bring forth fruits which demonstrate the reality of the repentance. So does the Christian. There's no forgetfulness in God because he is God. But such is the mercy of God. He not only forgives, but incredible as it may sound, he even forgets the sin of the penitent. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgressions for the remnant of his inheritance, Micah says? You forgave the iniquity of your people. You did pardon all their sin. Psalm 85. The rabbi said injury must be repaired, pardon sought and forgiven. The true repentant is he who has the opportunity to do the same sin again in the same circumstances, but who does not do it. The rabbi stressed again and again the importance of human relationships and of setting them right. More importantly, scriptures themselves teach restitution of the damage of our sin insofar as possible. Re resolution that we should not willingly sin again. There's one last Jewish belief about repentance, a belief which must have been in John's mind. 
said at least of the Jewish teachers that taught if Israel could repent perfectly for even one day, then the Messiah would come. It was only the hardness of the hearts of men which delayed the sending of God's Redeemer into the world. Remember Luke was a Gentile. Luke says God would bring salvation to all nations in order for people to have opportunity of salvation from God. Repentance is essential. Now all men can have opportunity to be saved, but they need to turn from the lifestyle that they have. Come back to God. Repentance was the very centre of the Jewish faith. It is also the very centre of the Christian faith. For repentance is turning away from sin and turning back towards God. Which brings us to the place where our sin can be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. As we respond to the gospel message with faithful obedience as Christ has commanded and are prepared to live as God means us to live. If you've got anything out of this study, feel free to come back and join us once more. Every blessing.